there, Jason here from Unity3D.College. Today we're going to talk about common mistakes that developers make when they're getting started with Unity. Now I've seen these mistakes made by new programmers who are just getting started and experienced developers who work in web projects or enterprise things and just know what they're doing but they're just a little bit new to Unity. So let's get started. Now the first problem I see new developers struggle with or especially experienced developers who have a slightly different background struggle with is not taking advantage of all of the things that are in the editor, not using the editor properly, and instead trying to code features that already exist. So say for example, I've got a boat here, this little red boat, and I just want it to sail around a little bit. Perhaps it's just like an idle thing where the boat's going back and forth, maybe even a tutorial or some kind of a script where the boat needs to go from one place to another, turn, do a little bit of stuff like that. What I usually see people do, starting with, is just start writing code. So they'll create a script, a tutorial boat script, for example, give it an array of positions, keep track of the next position in an integer so we know exactly what position we want to go to, then write an update loop that maybe checks the distance to that position, increments it if we've reached the position, and then looks at where we want to go and slowly moves us forward with transform.translate, maybe multiplied by speed and delta time because we want it to be frame rate independent and controllable, but you get the idea. This is what I see a lot of the time. And in fact, to be honest, it's the same kind of thing that I did when I started. I built an entire tutorial system doing stuff like this to move my things around. Now I did it a little bit more advanced than that, but you get the idea. I still did it all in code and it was a really bad idea because there are some much, much better options. Now for something like this, Oh, let's hit play first and just watch what happens. I'm gonna hit play and watch my boat. Oh, look, it flipped sideways. It's acting weird and now it's just shaking back and forth. Um, it didn't even really do my turn like it was supposed to. So you get the idea. It's not perfect and I need to do a bit of work to kind of clean this up. Now, the reason it's flipping over, by the way, is that the forward axis is up and down. That's that blue arrow. So when I rotate it and use that look at or look towards, it's uh, pointing that forward direction there. So I'd have to parent this to another object. Whole big mess. There's an easy alternative though. If I open up my second demo scene here, you can see that instead of setting up a boat with a script like this, I can set up an animation. So here I've just created a boat with an animator on it and an animation and I can hit play and it'll kind of sail around and go back and forth and actually work. Now it's not beautiful my animation skills aren't that great and I didn't spend that much time on it, but it's a whole lot easier to set up and a whole lot easier to edit. Now, if you wanted to do this yourself, let's select this boat, we'll remove that script, and then we we'll just go to the animation window and hit create and create a new animation. I'll call this boat two. And then we'd enable our boat first, hit the record button and be in the movement mode, which is just W on the keyboard or right here then maybe move it a little bit, get a first keyframe. Then I select a point on this animation timeline. Now I use the mouse wheel to zoom out and this is in seconds. So that's one second, two seconds, three seconds. I go to like one second, drag it over here, bam, go to two seconds, drag it over here. Oh, yeah, drag it over here. And then maybe go to three seconds and drag it over here and even rotate it whatever this direction. You notice that the rotation's getting added. I could even maybe scale it up so it rotates and scales. Then I can stop recording, hit play, and watch my entire animation just kind of go. Look at that. Our boat's going, 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 slowly growing as it animates. And I didn't have to write any code. I don't have to mark down any positions. It just kind of works. Now this kind of thing works for UI elements, um, game objects, obviously, tutorial stuff. Another thing I see people struggle with is setting up audio levels and audio mixing systems. I've seen a lot of people build these not knowing that there's already an audio mixer built right into the engine. So if you want to do some leveling or attenuation or just muting channels, adjusting channels based on different things, check out the audio mixer and definitely use it. But just again, remember, there are a lot of these built-in systems that are there to cover all of the really common things. So if it's something that you think is common in a video game, there's probably a system in there that you should check out and learn about before you try to build your own. Now let's go on to some non-editor stuff. One of the most common issues I see for new developers in Unity is overuse of mono behaviors. When you create a script in Unity, it by default makes a mono behavior. So you right click, hit create, new C sharp script, you're getting a mono behavior, but you don't necessarily need one for everything. In fact, you probably don't need one for most things. 
It's just that the way that the engine works and the way the workflow is, it kind of leads you in that direction. So you need to watch out for that and just try to minimize what things are mono behaviors and only make things that really need to be a mono behavior actually be one. Now, if you're coming from web development or business development, you may be familiar with something like MVC. And if you are, just think of the mono behavior as a view that's just pretty interactive. It may have some pretty good code in there to keep it interactive, but generally it should be somewhat like a view. Now, don't try to force yourself into that though. So if you have a mono behavior and you need it to be a controller, it's controlling some stuff, totally fine. Just start thinking about actually separating out your code, even if the logic stuff is all happening in a mono behavior or in multiple mono behaviors, at least separate the things out so that you have the ones that act like a view and the ones that act like controllers. But don't go overboard and obviously don't overcomplicate your project. If you're building something simple like a Flappy Bird clone, don't worry about it at all. It's not a big deal. This is more important when you're getting into real bigger projects. Another common mistake I see developers who come from a web or business background make is ignoring or underusing prefabs. They tend to build their own game objects and set everything up in code instead of predefining these prefabs, which is pretty much what they're there for, and using them. Now, if it feels weird because it's not in code, you have to think of it a bit like a dependency injection system. These prefabs are the packaged up objects that have all of the dependencies ready to go, and you're just injecting them into your game at the right time by instantiating them. Of course, it's not exactly like dependency injection, but it's pretty close when it comes to a Unity context. So make sure that you're taking full advantage of these prefabs, and especially with the new prefab systems in 2018.3, we've got prefab variants and prefab hierarchies or nested prefabs. So definitely go check those out. If you haven't seen the videos, uh, I'll have them linked below. So you can go learn all about those and see how much they can really help with your project. Now, one mistake that I find is common across everybody is using the game object find options that are string based. So you can see I've got an example here with ship equals game object dot find with tag. And here people get tags, they learn about tags and they start using tags to find all of their objects. It kind of works, but it is kind of a slow process and it has another really bad side effect that it's hard to discover and it's hard to know when something's broken. So I can have my code just like this. Somebody can go in and make a change to the ship, maybe recreate the ship and forget to tag it as a ship and the game will stop working, but I don't get any compiler errors. I don't get any real notification that something is wrong. That's probably the biggest reason that I don't like it on top of the fact that it's just a little bit slower to find with tag instead of caching these things and using find object of type. Now the game object dot find call is the same, but even worse because here we're looking at the game objects actual name and game object names can change all the time. Somebody renames a prefab that instantiated object name might change. Somebody has some code that adds a little bit of debug info. The object name changes. Somebody just renames the object. It changes and everything breaks again. And the problem here is again, you don't get compiler notifications. You just sit there wondering what's wrong. You have to debug and you're wasting time. I mean, a simple little thing like a tag missing could end up, you know, maybe taking you five minutes. It could end up taking somebody four hours or two days to try to figure it out before they finally realize, oh, it was a stupid tag. Somehow it got removed. I don't know what happened. Now, when we go on to talking about tags, camera.main is the biggest offender. And a lot of people have actually run into this issue. And it's the same issue as with the ship. It's just even more hidden. So camera.main calls camera for what is it game object dot find with tag and it uses that main camera tag that's why when you create a new scene it has that main camera tag on it so if you add a new camera delete that old one you may have noticed hey the project stopped working what's going on i can't see anything or i'm getting errors on all these camera dot main calls it's because it's using that tag kind of underneath and it's i'd say hidden and secret although it's a pretty well-known secret if you're getting into Unity or just kind of new with it, it's uh, very easy to make that mistake. In fact, I've made it a million times. Now, it doesn't make sense to talk about performance issues without talking about profiling. The profiler used to be a pro-only feature back in the Unity 4 and 5 days, but now it's free for everybody and you should definitely take advantage of it. If you're going in there and just kind of guessing what you think is slow, you're probably going to be wrong. And if you're coming from a standard programming experience, you're probably really not gonna know what to look for. Generally, things that cause big issues are 
just slow running code that's in an update loop, probably a number one cause. Things like debug.log calls in an update loop are actually really terrible. So when you're profiling, make sure that you're watching for those and disabling those when you really want to get a speed speed number there or a frame rate. And also make sure that you do a build to your actual device when you want to get your real frame rate. So back to the profiler though. Some other things you can do are look for garbage collector allocations and garbage collector calls. You might not see it in here because we're really not doing anything, but a lot of the time with a project, you'll see big giant spikes and freezing or hitching. Now in a Win web app or a Windows app, you might be able to hide that and mask it and it might not be a big deal. But in a game, when your game freezes up for half a second, it's huge. It makes a big noticeable difference and it feels like there's something wrong. If it freezes up longer than that, obviously it gets much worse. And if it's a fast paced game, you pretty much ruin your game just by having bad performance and having those little hitches. Those generally come from generating a bunch of garbage for the C sharp garbage collector or the CLR garbage collector to collect and clean up. This happens by instantiating a bunch of objects that you don't necessarily need and then destroying them again. That's why in games, we generally like to pool things and reuse these objects. So we'll create an object, maybe deactivate it, hide it away, and then bring it back when we need another one of those. Say I've got ships that are destroyable. I'll never actually destroy my ship. I'll just kind of move it off the screen, maybe change an animation or something, and then bring it back to life when I need it. Because creating a new game object generates some garbage, destroying it just means I have to garbage collect later. So I want to avoid that at all costs. Well, not all costs, but at most costs. Now, I also want to say that that doesn't mean you should never generate any garbage, especially if you're getting started. If you're just starting out with Unity, don't worry too much about it until it starts to become an issue. Now, the reason for that is you don't want to kind of get derailed trying to figure this out while you're also trying to learn everything else. But once you get to the point where you're getting like that, that big spike that just went by, that means you need to start worrying about this. And you can actually click on this and uh, let's see, let's take a quick look. If we expand out the player loop here and sort by GC allocation, you can see what's actually generating that garbage. And this 17 bytes may seem small, and it really is, but you gotta remember that's per frame. We're running hundreds of frames a second, you know, and this is a lot of bytes, and it'll slowly add up over a couple minutes. And that's why it took a while before we got that, that big spike. Now, if we were doing a lot more, this could be a lot faster and be an issue. Anyway, when we're talking about performance, just make sure that you profile, don't guess. Now, before we go any further, I wanna bring up a couple of the other systems that I see people commonly try to recreate. And these include things like camera controls or camera systems. So if you're building a game that's just got a relatively common or standard camera system, or even a semi-advanced one, but not very custom, you should definitely try out Cinemachine. Now, if you have to really fine tune it, whatever. But for most cases, Cinemachine works great at handling nice transitions. It does follow cameras and everything else really well. So I highly recommend you check that out. Also, if you wanna build a tutorial, the first time I did it, I went through and scripted everything. I made a special scripting system so our designer could go in and change things and adjust things. And then, well, Timeline got released and it kind of solves all of those problems. Now you can just build a tutorial with Timeline. It'll take a little bit of time to get used to it, but once you do, you can do amazing things, build up a whole system that's very visual and very easy for you to edit and change later. And the last one I want to talk about is Doozy UI. So if you're building out a UI system for your game and maybe you want your buttons to wiggle and you want to do some fading and zooming, all that kind of stuff, Again, don't try to rebuild all that stuff from scratch. Just go in and grab Doozy UI. This one's the only one that's not free, but it's definitely worth it. And, oh, I almost forgot. Before I go any further, if you're doing anything with text, make sure that you're pulling in Text Mesh Pro. Not really a code issue, but don't use the regular text. Use Text Mesh Pro. It looks way better, performs better. It's all around a better option. Now, the next thing I want to talk about doesn't apply to everybody. But a good number of people I know start to make a game, they start to learn how to code, or maybe they're learning how to code games, and then they need some art. And what they tend to do, at least a good number of them, is try to create that art on their own. They start thinking like, hey, I'm a game maker now, I need to make my own art, and you know, these guys made their own art in their own game, that's what I should be doing. It's really not. If you're just starting out learning how to make games, learning how to code and create games, 
don't try to create your own art as well. You're really trying to learn two things at once. Now, if you're an artist already and these things come natural and it's very easy, sure. But for most people, it's almost like you're trying to learn two different jobs or two different skill sets at the same time. Like if you're trying to create a new painting, you wouldn't want to be creating the paints, the paper and painting on there. You want to do just the one thing. Be good at the one thing. And then once you're good at that, maybe consider working on something else. But when you're starting out, really just focus on learning how to make a game, learning how to make it good, and learning how to finish it. And that's probably the biggest thing. Make sure that you actually build your games out, finish them, and share them. A lot of people will get started, they'll make a couple little prototypes, not really finish anything, or they'll make a little game and never show anybody because they think it's not good enough, it's not uh, whatever, not fancy enough, it's not Call of Duty, nobody's gonna wanna play it. People will play it, people will give you feedback, and it's generally pretty positive and good feedback. Now, if you're not sure where to post these games, uh, I like to just do WebGL games and build them out and put them on Simmer.io, or I'll build out a Steam game and release it as a real project. But in general, if you wanna just widely publish it, Simmer.io, uh, itch.io is another option. Not quite as easy to use from what I remember, but still really good. Um, but whatever you do, make sure that you're actually sharing your game. This could just be putting it onto a mobile device, publishing it up to the Google Play Store. I think it's free. It was free last time I looked. Very easy to do and get people playing your stuff. It really motivates you to keep building more and you kind of learn from the experience. When you see people play, see that they do things a little different, you'll learn and your games will get better and you'll be a better developer in the end. Anyway, I hope this is at least a little bit helpful. There are a whole bunch of other things that people do kind of wrong or mistakes that people make. If you have some good ones that you have seen people struggle with before, please just drop them down in a comment below. I'll probably do a follow-up video on this with all of the things that I've forgotten and everybody reading will probably appreciate it as well. Also, special thanks to everybody on Patreon and all my email subscribers, really appreciate you all. Um, all right, thanks, bye.